excited that you could join us for today's talk on mobile GIS, collecting GIS data on archaeological survey with Dr. Ian Lindsay from Purdue University. So today's talk is actually the last in a series of seminar presentations we've called GIS from the ground up, introducing geospatial tools for archaeological research. Over the last few weeks, we have had different scholars of archaeology, heritage, um, and or GIS in the South Caucasus present on a different GIS technique, focusing on how it contributes to their research questions. Um, we have welcomed audience members at all levels of GIS experience, but the aim of each presentation has been to introduce scholars unfamiliar with geospatial methods to the anatomy of a GIS-focused research project and elements of GIS research design through real-world case studies. So before we get started, uh, we want to acknowledge that this series is co-hosted by the American Research Institute of the South Caucasus, the Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa Project, and the National Agency for Cultural Heritage Preservation of Georgia. Funding for this series is provided by the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs uh, through a grant to the Council of Overseas Research Centers. Sorry, the Council of American Overseas Research Centers. So, um, <clears throat> I now have the pleasure to introduce uh, today's presenter, Dr. Ian Lindsay. So, Ian is Associate Professor at uh, Purdue University. His research focuses on the origins of complex society in the South Caucasus. He is co-director of the Project Aragat in Armenia. Recently has begun a new survey project in the Upper Kazakh River Valley in Armenia to study fortified landscapes of the Bronze and Iron Ages. In particular, uh, Dr. Lindsay has been using UAVs or drones to create high resolution aerial images, digital elevation models, and photogrammetric models of ancient landscapes to aid survey. He is also a former president of, of RS. So without further ado, uh, please welcome me in, sorry, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Ian Lindsay. Ian. Thank you, uh, Kristen, very much. Um, so I will uh, go ahead and share my screen. Um, and you can tell me if you are seeing everything okay. Okay. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, it's nice to, uh, to be here to sort of round up the GIS uh, speaker series. Um, I see some familiar faces in the chat. Some of you have, have uh, kind of been with us for the long haul, so that's great. Um, I'll try to get through this in, in, a, in a sort of an efficient manner so we can have time for, for Q&A and then maybe open it up for a sort of broader Q&A um, to, to address kind of uh, summary questions that you may have about GIS having, having seen um, hopefully some of the talks that we've had over the last couple of months um uh beginning with christians um so what we want to kind of go over today is uh some topics including sort of what is mobile gis right how does it differ from from other forms of gis we've heard about and sort of contextualize it within other um, trends within archaeology paperless archaeology and digital archaeology and, and kind of um introduce how I'm using that in Armenia what the research context of it is that Kristen touched on uh, briefly there in the intro um, talk a bit about uh, sort of two different uh, surveys that we did um, one analog and, and the more recent one digital and, and, and how we kind of compare the two in terms of data collection and management and then kind of focus a bit more on um, the, uh, the system that I used based on ArcGIS collector um, and, uh, and, and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is, is sort of general. It's, it's going to be sort of um, uh, system agnostic or platform agnostic. Uh, some of the concepts are going to carry over to different, different mobile GI systems, but um, I will talk a little bit also about some of the particularities of, of collectors since it's the system that, that I used um, and then kind of wrap up with some kind of pros and cons. Um, so generally then what uh what do we mean by the term mobile gis um essentially we use the term mobile gis uh, to refer to the collection editing analysis and visualization of geospatial data right that's the gis part that we've been hearing about for the past several weeks 
Um, but the difference is we carry it into the field um, rather than doing it on a workstation in, in our uh, lab, uh, we actually take the, the GIS with us, right? Um, and and uh, so as such, um, this mobile GIS uh, generally involves the use of, as you can imagine, mobile devices, right? And so in the, in the early 90s, in 2000s, when we first started to see this technology emerge, this meant PDAs or expensive Trimble GPS systems, which are still in use, of course. But more recently, we see the use of uh, the proliferation of, of mobile phones, right? And tablets and laptops that are equipped with onboard GPS and GIS software. And the use of wireless communication and cellular networks uh, allow mobile GIS devices to serve really as an extension of a desktop GIS system on surveys and excavations. And we inset this new mobile GIS technology within a broader movement going back to uh, around 2012 or so. I don't know, archaeologists like to put origin dates on things, but, but generally somewhere in the, in the early teens. Um, some like to say that the University of Cincinnati's Pompeii project was, was one of the first to go sort of fully digital in their, in their excavations uh, through the use of iPads as they became more and more popular. Um, but we generally, in any case, around the, you know, the last decade, um, we can see this term, we can see terms starting to be used in the literature like paperless or digital or even cyber archaeology. And uh, whatever you want to call it, um, the reality is that archaeology projects are becoming more expensive, fieldwork is, is becoming expensive, and, and this often results in, in shorter, more intensive field seasons. And as a result, we're relying more and more on um, paperless recording technologies to increase the efficiency and, and accuracy of field data collection and management. And these data collection systems can range from custom built commercial systems to cloud-based subscription apps to open source uh, DIY platforms. And each of these um, systems represent an individual solution discussed in the literature to highly variable field conditions, project budgets, and digital skill sets that can characterize archaeology projects. So in short, there's not a one size fits all solution to digital data collection. Um, and it certainly goes for um, building a mobile GIS system as well. So when considering um, developing a mobile GIS system, um, and, and, and some of these tables that are, I'm showing, I'll, I'll put in the references to them in the chat. Um, you're uh, first faced with a number of uh, technical, financial, and in a sense, philosophical choices. Um, as we've heard from several of our prior speakers, Esri, uh, the maker of the ArcGIS uh, suite of geospatial software, has been at the forefront of the commercial GIS solutions. Um, but the past decade has also seen the expansion of open source mobile GIS solutions, such as uh, QField which is the mobile counterpart part to the popular QGIS uh, software, as well as things like GeoODK or Open Data Kit that make them attractive and cost-effective alternatives to expensive ArcGIS licenses. Thus far, however, both popular open source solutions, QField and ODK are only available for Android dev devices and lack some of the tools and support of commercial products. But in any case, um, Commercial versus open source, the device platforms you plan to use in the field, these are just two of the factors that um, you need to consider early when thinking about uh, a, a mobile GIS system. And in addition, um, as I kind of outlined in this table from a, a recent article I, I put out about this uh, ArcGIS uh, Arc collector system, just briefly, it's worth noting that, that uh, spatially aware data collection apps also tend to fall in a couple different categories. Um, one of them is form-centric apps that are pretty common in compliance and resource management settings where forms need to be very standardized, right? Um, but often these only record point features. They're, they're more sort of based on, on digital, um, digital versions of, of site forms, right? But there are also map-centric apps such as QField and ArcGIS Collector that function more as complete um, mobile GIS solutions. And they can collect the full range of point, line, and polygon data geometry, 
and the, the, the pro versions read the paid versions of these softwares um, can also export GIS data to standard in, in standard GIS or geospatial file formats like KML, shape files, et cetera. So they can be integrated into ArcGIS or QGIS um, geodatabases or, or for use in Google Earth and so forth. So there's some interoperability between these software packages thanks to sort of um, uh, open, open uh, GIS standards, uh, but oftentimes you can have to pay for the pro versions of that, of that capability. So the point is there's, there's a number of options and the number of, of, of capabilities that, and then price points that these um, have uh, these software packages have. Um, so the ones that I outlined here are ArcGIS Collector and, and QField are, are some of the, the more popular ones. One is free, one is not. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, each of these. Uh, so my own um, uh, particular decisions that I made, just a sort of a spoiler alert, um, the choices I ended up making when I designed my system starting in 2014, uh, was to build it around Esri's ArcGIS Collector app. Back then it was called Collector for ArcGIS, which we deployed on iPad, Apple, uh, Apple iPad Air tablets. Um, Purdue, my university, uh, has, has a license to ArcGIS, and so it's fairly easy. It was a platform that my collaborators in our media had experience with um, using ArcGIS. And it's a map-centric interface, which is important uh, in archaeology. And plus it only required intermediate GIS skills to deploy. It doesn't require a lot of advanced uh, coding, which was nice. Um, at the time, Collector was still fairly new and hadn't had a lot of field testing by archeologists, but it did have many of the features that I wanted in a survey system, um, which I'll outline in, in more detail in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but first to the South Caucasus. Um, so our, our recent data collection workflow was developed in the context of the Cossack Valley Archaeological Survey, or CVAS, which entailed intensive and extensive settlement survey, aerial mapping, uh, and test excavations in the upper Cossack River Valley of uh, north central Armenia. The CVAS survey began in 2014 in the upper Cossack River Valley of north central Armenia and um, was an initiative of Project Aragats, which is a, a long-standing American-Armenian collaboration, which since 1998 has been uh, investigating ancient bronze and Iron Age complex polities in the region. So we're going to find out. We did a lot of things in the survey. We're going to primarily just kind of look at some of the tran uh, the transex survey aspects of it, how we deployed mobile GIS uh, there. So in 1998 uh, and 2000, Project Aragats began two seasons of survey in the Tsakahovi Plain, which is a basin in Armenia's northwestern uplands at approximately 2,000 meters in elevation, situated between the Pombok Range uh, to the north and Mount Aragats. The survey, followed uh, by several seasons of fortress and cemetery excavations, have provided uh, uh, a detailed map of the region's dense archaeological landscape and a well-developed model of settlement from the initial appearance of villages in the region around 3000 BC through its abandonment around 400 BC. And the upper Cossack River Valley, uh, just to the east, was selected for the more recent phase of our survey to establish a comparative framework for settlement systems in the region and because the valley's strategic position as a prominent transportation and communication corridor to high elevation resources. So embarking on a new survey also provided the opportunity to design a data collection system from the ground up, uh, allowing us to reflect on how new digital solutions might help us overcome some of the challenges encountered during our initial 1998-2000 settlement survey in the Sakahovi Plain. For example, in 2000, sites encountered on transect were recorded in field notebooks with coordinates fixed using handheld GPS devices, which is a common practice that still holds value in the field today. And while the hybrid paper digital method worked pretty well for singular archeological features, such as fortresses and settlements, it was less adept at capturing the redundant, tightly packed clusters of Bronze Age, Cromlech, and Kurgan burials that stretched along the foothills uh, surrounding the Sakahovi Plain. 
So faced with such high frequencies of burials, surveyors described uh, representative tombs within a burial cluster and then estimated the number of burials it contained. In essence, the cluster, the burial cluster became the minimum unit of recording a mortuary landscape since it was impossible to record each individual tomb given the constraints of time and technology. So on survey, you're, you're consistently trying to, to balance. You have a certain number of time, a, a certain number of days in the field, certain budget, certain amount of area you want to cover. And so you're always sort of you know, weighing those variables and how much time am I gonna spend uh, at each site? How much time do I have? Um, and, and, and so forth. So, so all those sorts of considerations are, are sort of weighed um, and, and how much resolution you can afford to, to, to collect in the field for, for each site, right? Um, and so the technology you're using to record them uh, has an effect on that. And so it's impossible to record individual tombs in an analog sort of mode, given the constraints of time and technology. Nevertheless, it was clear that there were volumes of untapped spatial data in the mortuary and archaeological landscapes once the technology had advanced enough to efficiently capture them in the field. So for example, um, so you can see uh, here one of our um, uh, burial clusters near the Zakahovit fortress, uh, which is located here, sort of dense um, clusters of, of burials. Um, and there wasn't a lot of time to sort of write down each uh, attributes of each one of these. Um, and, and, the, and, and there's a lot of quite a bit of variability within mortuary landscapes. Their surface architecture uh, varies, the size of tombs vary, um, the conditions of them vary. Um, and, and so forth. So capturing that, uh, that variability is, um, you know, is valuable. And so finding a solution that will help us do that efficiently was, was important for this new survey. We also want to sort of pinpoint spatially, not just sort of the cluster, but how uh, the arrangement of the clusters, how they relate spatially to fortresses so we can make um, some arguments about political affiliation and, and how broader Bronze Age landscapes are, are constituted. So in essence, what we really want to do is to go from, um, uh, find a system that could take us from here where we're only sort of estimating the number of barrels and, and recording them in, in a cluster, noting the range of types, for example. We kind of want to go from here uh, to here where we can record efficiently a lot of different attributes and use those in our GIS analysis, spatial analysis and, and attribute analysis without spending a lot of extra time at the site. So in brainstorming, um, which features we wanted in a survey data collection system, we identified a number of parameters that were important to us, including um, you know, the ability to back up have backup procedures to protect data integrity, right? Once it starts getting into the digital domain, uh, data integrity becomes very important, data preservation, safe, safety, security. We also wanted to take advantage of the burgeoning technologies of mobile devices that, that you know, everybody was having access to. Um, their familiar user interface that we could uh, deploy uh, in GIS uh, with GIS tools. Um, we wanted, inter uh, we wanted um, to be platform agnostic as much as possible, to be operable on both Apple and Android devices, um, to make the workflow, GIS workflow easy, right, for non-specialists, or rather straightforward um, uh, for beginning surveyors. Um, and we also wanted to provide access to legacy data, uh, to maps, to historic maps, to imagery of our survey area to legacy site data. Um, and these are all sort of the benefits of, of having mobile GIS on your devices. You can sort of flip to it and access it very quickly. And we also wanted to uh, maximize equitable information flow between surveyors. Um, uh, traditionally uh, on, on a analog survey, you may have a, a survey leader, a crew chief who has the expensive Trimble, right? And who does a lot of the sort of uh, detailed mapping um, and everybody else is kind of using notebooks and so forth to record, but, but having everybody with GPS enabled devices and, and uh, the data tables at their fingertips makes a more equitable uh, workflow and everybody can sort of contribute to the sort of iter iterative process of recording and, and, and interpreting sites. So these are some of the things that we were, were interested in developing with this new survey. And Esri's new, then new anyway, collector app appeared that it would satisfy many of our survey needs. 
Collector was developed in a way that allows project managers to control which data fields in a GIS are visible or editable um, to users on their devices in order to both maximize consistency and minimize uh, entry errors, which is a feature that has clear value on survey. So pretty much standard in most GIS apps, the ability to pre-program pull-down menus for each, each um, data field also vastly reduced the inconsistencies in data quality and accuracy uh, found in paper forms and notebooks. In addition, unlike site information recorded on paper forms that must be manually entered and compiled into a project database, data in Collector uh, is transferred instantly to the project GIS and synced across project devices. This real-time sync feature provided us the ability to, number one, facilitate in-field consultation between survey surveyors, allowing survey leaders quickly um, to quickly address data collection errors in the field. And uh, number two, avoid burdensome and potentially risky manual syncing of devices to a master database each night. Every time there's, uh, there's manual syncing involved, which um, a lot of other, uh, other um, apps require uh, your data is always in sort of this limbo mode right so i always get nervous when there's manual syncing uh, involved um, and this sort of helps mitigate um, mitigate that process a bit so just um briefly looking at, a, at the model pipeline data pipeline of creating a a um, rts project workflow you essentially have um, three separate stages where you develop the project in a desktop GIS uh, software, such as ArcGIS uh, Pro or ArcMap, um, where you create and author a map and the layers that you want to, to you know, create your sort of site form, basically your digital site form, which is then pushed to um, a web GIS platform that Esri runs called ArcGIS Online. And from there, your um, the, the uh, web GIS platform can, can sync back to your, your desktop um, uh, map. But it's within the ArcGIS Online platform that, that the user interface is configured, uh, where you you know secure the settings. You you say which which fields uh, you want to have visible to the end user, uh, and the, the orders you want them presented, and, and so forth. And then your your forms are then pushed to the mobile device, um, which is a uh, collector is downloaded onto your phone or your app or your uh, your tablet. And then your map is downloaded and you can kind of go about your business of um, adding data, collecting data, querying, editing data and so forth in the field. And then uh, on, on each of the uh, devices um, and then through a, networks, uh, a network connection, that data is then synced in real time back to um, RTS online platform and then it's bounced uh, in real time again to your desktop system. So you can really access and edit the data on, um, on mobile devices, on a browser-based system or on your so desktop software. Um, and, and so it can be accessed by all the team members um, simultaneously, which is, which is very handy in terms of, of collaboration. Uh, and so comparing that to say a QGS environment, the, the end user interface is, is actually quite similar. The process of developing um, your web forms or your, your field forms um, are, are quite similar. Um, it's just, a, it, it's simpler in some ways in QGIS, but it's more complicated in some ways as well. So you'll develop your, your, your baseline GIS database on the desktop. Um, but rather than have uh, a network uh, syncing process, uh, you sort of download your uh, workflow to tablets through either through, you know, plugging into your, you'll export your uh, geo database to, um, to a mobile version in uh, what's called QField. Uh, but then you have to sort of plug in your device to the computer. Uh, there's a new beta version of a cloud uh, syncing system called QField Cloud. Uh, which you push your map onto the devices and then go about collecting your, uh, your data in the field. <clears throat> and then again, you sort of have to manually collect, manually, uh, sorry, hit the wrong arrow. Um, once you collect your data in the field, you're gonna have to manually synchronize it, copy it back to uh, what I call the mothership or the desktop uh, geo database. So every every user then has to sort of manually sync their their device back onto um, 
the, the primary geodatabase. So again, you're introducing a little bit of risk there, um, but it is the, the, the user interface is, is gonna be quite similar, but the syncing process is a little bit different. The advantage uh, with QGIS, of course, is that it's free and doesn't require the subscriptions that, that ArcGIS does. But those are sort of two systems that, that are one in the open source domain and one in the commercial domain. The, the, the operability, the, um, the workflow is, is quite similar. Uh, they're just slightly different processes. So just kind of running through really quick the, the interface, user interface on a tablet. Again, these are gonna be quite similar between, um, between open source and the, and the commercial systems. Um, but uh, essentially, you will be you, you when you are on a tablet, you'll be sort of faced with you know uh, a satellite image, a base map, and when you land on a site, you'll uh, in case of collector, what you're looking at is a collector interface. You'll hit the little plus button to add a site, and then what you'll be faced with is a series of uh, site type options that you have pre-programmed in your your GIS, your desktop GIS. Um, and you'll select the, in our case, you'll select, um, in this case, an artifact scatter, a site type of, of what you're standing on. Um, and that will pull up essentially the forms that you have uh, generated, uh, the fields that you have generated in your GIS that you'll then, um, you'll then fill out. Uh, most of these, again, are populated by preset pull-down menus using what are called domains. Um, and again, for, uh, for, for this case, we can see an artifact scatter and we have a surface material field that we've pre-populated with options. So rather than have everybody type in uh, Paleolithic and, and uh, under the hot sun misspelling Paleolithic or, or, or what have you, um, or, or um, selecting multiple options, there can be just sort of a quick checkbox that, that you select um, for for this type of field, right? So you'll go through and, and enter uh, a lot of, of different fields, um, your name, date, and all these sorts of things that are really just a touch of a button, right? There's not a lot of typing involved except for the narrative description. Um, and then you'll finish completing your, uh, your data entry and you can attach photos from, from your device as well. Uh, and, and these are again, quickly sort of pushed to the primary database that can be read by any of the, any of the field um, operators. So this is kind of useful in, in a densely populated tomb. If we come across a, a burial cluster with say you know, 30 or 40 burials in it, um, uh, each person can, can contribute to recording individual burials in the tomb. Uh, and we can see what the others are doing, right? So we don't sort of repl replicate efforts. Uh, and that's sort of helpful as well and, and allows crew chiefs to, um, allows crew chiefs to, um, to correct errors and, and, and so forth. So um, helps with the sort of workflow there as well. So during our, our survey of the Upper Cossack Valley, we recorded basic size and form attributes of individual burials of which we recorded over 1200 in the Eastern Aragats foothills. And one of the features of the collector app that we relied on heavily is the copy paste function. This is really what sort of let us um, record individual burials at a high speed. Um, and again, reducing data entry redundancies given the high frequency of tombs that minimize both human error and the time needed to record adequate attributes from each feature. So this made analysis of burial densities more nuanced and, and precise uh, and allowed us to sort of quantify um, uh, the burials, burial frequencies more efficiently. So for example, in the Cossack Valley, we can see that burials surrounding the Operani Baird Fortress here, which is one of our, our larger burials that we were investigating, were by far the densest and most extensive cemeteries that we recorded um, as visualized in the optimized hotspot analysis on the right, where we see st statistically significant concentrations of them around this fortress. Um, what's more, because we recorded uh, size, uh, relative size and, and so forth, or absolute size of the burials, we can see that Operani Baird also hosts um, <clears throat> the greatest number of large kurgans, uh, meaning over 10 meters uh, in diameter, and so something's going on at this fortress. We can see that it's a lot of uh, um, large kurgans are gravitating toward this fortress to a greater degree than other, than other fortresses are. 
And by recording um, evidence for amelioration and ground, uh, so there's an overhead shot of, of one of the barrel clusters at Alperani Baird, we can also record the amelioration evidence, things like irrigation features, um, pipelines and so forth that are affecting cutting through the, the, the cemetery and impacting it. And we can sort of look at the, in the GIS, the, the burial frequencies in relation to this amelioration evidence and really conclude that, well, uh, as, as big as the Upper Ronde Buried Cemetery is, it was clearly much bigger in the past, uh, given how much amelioration was going on. So it must have been a huge cemetery during the Bronze Age. Um, so in conclusion, we're, we're fortunate that even in rural mountainous portions of Armenia, uh, network connectivity is available throughout almost all of our project area and outfitting the project iPads with SIM cards with unlimited data plans for the season is fairly affordable. As a result, we're able to collect survey data in online mode almost continuously. And on the occasions where our survey fell in a network shadow or a dead zone, we were also able to, to download the web map to each device and sync the data when we return to an area with internet service. Though some form of offline mode is a pretty standard feature nowadays in, in most mobile GIS apps on the market. And again, having data layers synced across devices also opens the door for more equitable access to site data, which in turn allows for more meaningful consultations with project personnel on transect. Um, and as well as, as, as consulting folks at, in a base camp and, and virtually anywhere with an internet connected device or workstation. I can send, uh, I can, I can uh, email people in the US and say, hey, take a look at this site. Let me know what you think. What, is, what are we looking at here? And if needed, the spatial accuracy sacrificed by iPads, iPads get about three to five meter GIS GPS accuracy. You can improve that by connecting external third party GNSS receivers as well. Um, though of course these are an extra drain on, on batteries. Um, but it's always advisable in, the, in a mobile GIS uh, environment to, to bring external chargers, right? Sort of equipment needs should always include external chargers just um, simply because exposure to temperature extremes can, can uh, impact battery life as well as sort of just using it all, all day, right? So the, the advantages that we see with Collector, um, I think were, were pretty uh, apparent, um, but the decision to commit to an ArcGIS platform is not something that we took lightly, right? The, the low cost alternatives to proprietary um, enterprise scale software packages are, are particularly important among archeology span projects that collaborate internationally um, with economically constrained institutions. So the platform that you wanna to commit to and the hardware that you commit to um, should, should be part of uh, decisions that you make. And, and we did give a lot of consideration to ethics and, and risks of encumbering local partners with uh, hardware and software commitments necessary to sustain a commercial GIS system. And there's a lot of passionate debates among the GIS user community about the merits of open source versus, versus commercial GIS packages that pivot on economic, economic and technical and, and ethical considerations. But the platform selected by a project really will be informed by the project's objectives, um, its budgets, its support structure, and its technical background. So, so um, what I kind of hope to get across is just some of the decisions that go into making a uh, building a mobile GIS system and, and, and some of the, the pros and cons of, of each one, but, but ultimately um, Collector was, was pretty useful uh, for, for us. So um, hopefully this gave you a little bit of a taste of, of a recent mobile GIS system and, and I'm happy to entertain any uh, any questions or or, um, or discussion of of the process? All right, thank you, Ian. <clears throat> so we'd like to turn to the uh, Q and A portion of our session. Um, and as a reminder, questions and discussions are to remain civil and academic. If you have any questions, you can place uh, number one in the chat box, and we will know to call on you. You 